In the year 1900, respected physicist Lord Kelvin said, There is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Now, with that kind of stuff, would you want to become a physicist? This sounds pretty boring. Let's measure more and more precisely. Okay, now let's do it again with a new tool. Great. So, here's the thing. This was about as wrong as he could possibly be because in the next 25 years, all of physics would be turned on its head by two amazing new theories that really caused people to investigate what life was, what the universe was, what perception means, and how consciousness plays into physics. These are very big questions, and Lord Kelvin sure called it wrong. In fact, he had a big part in actually flipping physics over on his head. So let's go to those two things that uh, <clears throat> he had he had a couple hesitations. He referred to them as dark clouds, and one of them was the Michelson-Morley experiment. Michelson and Morley were trying to measure the ether. They were trying to see how light traveled through space because waves require a medium through which to travel, and they wanted to know if they could see the fact that Earth was sometimes, see Earth is right, uh, <clears throat> well that's the sun, and Earth is going like this, so sometimes Earth's going that way and sometimes Earth's going that way. They were hoping, and they really ought to have been able to measure, our velocity through the ether, this way at one time of the year and the other way at the other time of the year, or in fact just a velocity at all through the ether. What are the odds that we're perfectly at rest to the ether? Pretty much zero. Even if we are at rest relative to ether, that's the ether is this thing that light has to travel through, even if we are at rest relative to the ether, then if you send light this way and some light that way, then what are the odds that those lights are going to experience exactly the same pattern through the ether? I don't know. Ether is an interesting idea, but wow was that wrong. So they couldn't explain the Michelson-Morley experiment with the fact that waves go through the vacuum of space, there seem to be some strange implications there, and black body radiation. And our subject today is black bodies. So consider... Consider for me, if you will, a black body. I can safely say that all of modern physics comes from sitting around and considering black bodies. Here is a picture of a black body. The idea is that it is a cavity and there's a very, very small opening. So if we send a ray of light into this cavity, then let's say it's going this direction, it will go into the cavity and bounce around and every time there's a bounce, you would certainly agree that each bounce carries a finite probability of being absorbed. So let's say it's bounced around 70 times or something. It has probably been absorbed. As long as this opening here is very small, the idea of a black body is such that light that comes in cannot get out as reflected light. So you know when you're looking at stuff like your computer screen, well, not your computer screen, dang it. If you look at a flower pot sitting over there, you know the reason that you see the flower pot is because that flower pot is reflecting light towards your eyes. Don't talk about your computer screen right now. My point is, uh, <clears throat> the black body will never reflect light towards your eyes. So in fact, if you look at a black body, you actually see its true light that is coming from within it. And maybe you didn't know that when things are hot, they glow, but this is true. When things are hot, they do in fact glow. So black bodies let out light. In fact, since no reflected light gets out of a black body, the, bl the black body's light is its own true light and it's a characteristic thing. But the cool thing about black bodies is they don't have to be this um, hollow box with a tiny hole poked in it that's smeared with charcoal on the inside so it's not very reflective at all. Um, and we try to absorb, even with 70 hits, of, uh, even if it were a mirror and this hole is really tiny, you could still get it to be a black body. But we want to coat it with black to make it as ideal as possible. The thing is, in the infrared wavelengths, my skin is black. Look at it. My skin is absorbing all the infrared that's hitting it to a large degree. So let's consider, <clears throat> let's consider the problem. This is the problem that Lord Kelvin was aware of. He said intensity, this is what was known, intensity as derived by, oh, who are these guys? We're talking about, um, oh shoot. Raleigh and genes. The Raleigh genes law says that if, uh, if you're looking for the intensity of a black box that's radiating power out of it. Wait, can we talk a little bit more about the fact that things have certain colors? You ever heard of something that's red hot? 
Yeah, if you've got a red hot piece of metal, then it will be glowing red, and that's because some of its energy that it's emitting all the time is coming out as light energy that you can see. Uh, a lot of it is coming out as infrared, which is why you can feel things are hot if you get close to them, even if they're not glowing hot. And that makes stoves a little bit dangerous, and uh, soup too. Soup's a little bit dangerous. but. If you've got something that's even hotter, maybe you've heard of the phrase white hot. Something that's white hot is even hotter because it's not just spitting out red, it's also spitting out higher frequencies and therefore higher energies of light are present. So that's the idea behind this sensor right here. It's an infrared thermometer. If I turn it on and measure the temperature of the table right here, I find the temperature of the table to be 24.6 Celsius. And if I, I put it in my armpit, Watch that, oh yeah, my armpit is 30.6 Celsius. Okay, so that means that by looking at the color of light coming into this lens right here, it's able to calculate the temperature where it's pointing. Wow, that's pretty fancy. It's using some of the physics that we're studying today. So we've got two times the frequency square times this constant right here was Boltzmann's constant. We've seen it already a little bit with the kinetic theory of gases. And here's temperature, and we have to divide it by the speed of light squared. So this is a classically derived intensity that we would expect to be happening if we look into this black box. And let me graph what this looks like. This says that the intensity gets higher as the frequency gets higher, and in fact it says that the intensity doesn't ever get lower as the frequency gets higher. So, I mean, that may be a little bit redundant, but I want to point out what this is looking like here. I'm going to put this, I put it intensity in quotes because it's actually radians, which is a steradian you divide by the, um, gosh, it's complicated. I don't want to talk about it. I'm just going to call this intensity right here. It's kind of a scaling factor, probably a four pi squared or something. So here's frequency frequency f, and intensity is supposed to get bigger by the square of the, the frequency. So let's give ourselves a little purple thing to show what this is doing. This is a quadratic relationship. The only, I mean, I don't have any real problem with quadratic relationships, except that light costs energy. And this is in units of kind of, because of the steradians thing, it's kind of units watts per square meter. So I'm saying if you look in this hole, this prediction of the Raleigh genes equation says that if you look in the hole, your eye will be melted by the enormous amount of high frequency radiation that's coming out. In fact, you guys good at integrals? Can you integrate this sucker for me? Give me some bolts, uh, some uh, Riemann sums here. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Riemann the sum out that way. That is infinite. It looks even bigger than infinity because it's getting bigger this way too. That is an infinite amount of energy, and this is gently called the ultraviolet catastrophe. It's very high frequencies, so those imply sort of ultraviolet, and this is a disaster, or as it was called at the time and still called now, a catastrophe. The problem is, it's not real. This law so miserably fails at describing what's actually happening, because what's actually happening looks like seafoam green. Ready? This is reality. Reality is like, well, I'm gonna go up for a little bit, meeting your prediction, and then it goes, yump, and it's a smooth tailing off to the end. But this is real. That's what's actually happening. That's the intensity as a function of frequency. And that is a big difference over here at high frequencies. Now, a lot of people like to do these in terms of wavelength, so I think I should show that also. I'll show intensity as a function of wavelength. And that graph looks like this. That the, high, um, the high wavelength is a low intensity, so I'm gonna start my wrong graph over here. And the ultraviolet catastrophe says that as wavelength approaches zero, the amount of energy we've got coming out of the black body is infinity. That's kind of nasty. But what actually happens in seafoam green is we're tracing this line along for a little bit and then it goes and then at a higher temperature, ooh, 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 maybe I should emphasize this a little bit more. If you look at a black body or even any particular thing that's not particularly reflective, if you look at that thing, or wait, if you look at something in perfect darkness and it is only 
the only light coming from it is light that comes from its own temperature. I don't want any sort of chemical generation of light or anything. This would be a low temperature. As we raise the temperature, the color changes. So I'm saying that as far as black body radiation, the only thing that affects the color of a thing is its temperature. Color is proportional to temperature. And proportional might be a little bit sloppy of a thing to say. And that goes like that. This is a higher temperature. And this is a really high temperature, and it goes down. And uh, the cool thing is that the science that's going to result from this is going to be called quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics addresses the ultraviolet catastrophe and keeps these guys from exploding. But you have to recognize that this is a problem. Also, I want to point out that this peak wavelength here is given by Wien's displacement law. This peak wavelength, or we could talk about the peak frequency here for this real case right here. This is the frequency at the peak. And I'm just going to say that the frequency of the peak intensity is, in fact, some stupid constant. It's some number times the temperature. Ween said that. Pretty good idea, right? Very, very interesting. If you have a higher temperature, then you're going to peak at a higher frequency. Correspondingly, if you have a higher temperature, then your peak wavelength will be smaller, which is a higher energy bit of light. So I think I want to leave it right there and then tell you how Planck managed to solve this enormous problem in physics and uh, some of the consequences of his decisions. Goodbye.